Last lesson, we talked about water quality and the various factors and pollutants that can cause water quality to be poor. In this lesson, we're going to be learning about managing the water supply, making sure that that is clean and the three stages that go into doing that. So there are three stages to managing the clean water supply. The first one is collection. And then we need to make sure we treat the water. And after that, once it's clean, we can deliver the water. And I'm now going to explore how we do those three stages in slightly more detail. The first stage is collection. And this is where we are um, gathering water um, from sources. So aquifers, which is, is one of the sources that we can get water from, where we get water from under the ground, rivers, um, lakes, which is stores on the surface, and also stores on the surface in the form of reservoirs like the Kilda Water Dam we've already done. One thing that we need to know about the collection um, of water from these sources is that often have pollutants that are attached to them. So if I look at my aquifer over here, um, we would get um, seeping down into the green, uh, the groundwater, we would get pesticides, we would get um, fertilizers that would it would seep down off of the land and go into the into the water. We would also get if we um, looked um, at uh, into a, a reservoir, we would find that we would actually get acid rain. So this is where carbon dioxide dissolves in rainwater, and we would get find acid rain that would fall into reservoirs. Um, in rivers, as we've kind of talked before, um, often in lots of rivers, especially in uh, developing countries, we would get things like heavy metals that were dumped um, into the river, um, things like iron, but also chromium. And also we might get in rivers where water that had been in power stations that had been warmed up. Um, it would be sent back into the river and that would change the chemical composition. Um, and last but not least, in lakes, we often get sometimes something called algae blooms. These are um, caused by with new chemicals being put into them and there's these bacteria um, that grow on the river and create these um, large um, uh, organic forms on the actual river's uh, lake surface. And I'll show you an example of um, how that's happened uh, on the next bit. Here is an example of um, what I mentioned before. This is what we call an algae bloom here. This is why this um, lake, um, Lake Erie, which is near Detroit and uh, Cleveland in America, has gone this kind of green color. That is because what's happened um, on this farmland is lots of um, fertilizer has come off of the um, the land and run off into the river and, and this fertilizer um, has a, an, enabled the bacteria these little organisms these microscopic organisms to grow because there's lots of things like phosphorus in the in the fertilizer and that really helps these these tiny living um, uh, organic creatures to grow and then they grow and um, through the sunlight they are able to grow into these huge swarms. That's largely because of, of the stuff that's being poured into it from these um, agricultural and industrial areas. Sometimes in parts of Detroit they actually had sewage went into there and that again um, changed the chemical composition of the water and allowed these algae to bloom. So once we've collected the water, we then need to go to the next stage, which is treatment. Um, and this is a bit like applying some sort of first aid kit to the water. It's trying to make it cleaner and available for consumption. So we have five stages um, um, that, that all are used in water treatment plants. The first one is chlor um, chlorination. That's where you add chlorine to the water, a bit like in a swimming pool. And this kills off biological growth. So this will kill off anything like algae. Um, you can also have aeration. That's where you're adding oxygen to the water. And then what it does when it um, is in the water, it, it kind of oxidizes with any metals that are in there. So like iron and manganese, and therefore um, they become solids and they can be removed. Next, we have sedimentation. That's where any of those large sediments are, are slowed down so that they sink to the bottom um, of the large containers in which they're in. And that kind of removes any suspended solids that are in the water. Um, but obviously, that doesn't catch all of them. And so we need to use filtration to 
you know, remove those finer sediments, a bit like you do in science where you use um, filtration paper and you'll be able to just get all those ones that you can't see with, with the eye. And last but not least, um, we have disinfection. Um, that's where you're adding chemicals to the water. Again, this would often be something like chlorine uh, and that will kill any bacteria that is in the water. Here's an example of a water treatment centre uh, in action. We can see this is the water treatment centre for Oxford. Um, and we can see that here, these big tanks are what, where sedimentation would happen and the aeration would happen in these longer kind of corridor tanks. But as you can see, there's a lot of the processes going on here. The, the thing we have to remember is uh, Oxford is obviously in a HIC country, so it has the resources to be able to do all these variation stages to treat the water well but you might not get that in such countries as MICs or LICs where they might not have the financial resources to be able to um, treat their water on such a wide scale for the entire population. So we just looked at how HICs would treat their water uh, by looking at the treatment plant in Oxford. Here's how some of the poorest people in developing countries in MICs and LICs uh, might have to treat their water. It's a, it's a filtration method called a cloth filter, which is simply cloth put over um, whatever the device you're using and you pour the water through it. That would be able to get quite a few of um, sediments and silts and, and stuff like that out of it. But unfortunately, it wouldn't be able to get um, some of the microscopic um, diseases and, and bacteria that you'd find in water and therefore it isn't 100% effective. The last stage of managing uh, clean water supply is to do with delivery. So a lot of delivery would be done from pipes and that would go straight from treatment centres straight into people's homes um, and this is the kind of thing that we would often see um, in developed countries. And increasingly, this would be happening in countries like MICs, where they would have more and more of this, but it wouldn't be so universal. But in most developed countries, they would have um, piped water to pretty much every household. Other delivery methods include uh, wells or standpipes. But again, this is not what you would find um, in the developed world. This is in mainly LICs and some MICs. Another form of de um, delivery um, is actually becoming bottled water. This is the biggest growing bottled water is in the developing um, countries around the world. Um, but obviously we do have um, bottled water that is still a form of delivery that we would find in the developed world as well. So there are several problems that we get in both developing and developed countries um, in terms of managing the water supply. And I'm going to focus firstly on developing countries. So as we see in this top left hand picture, um, we have issues sometimes with collection. We've got some young um, women here that are collecting water and because they spend a lot of time collecting the water, sometimes having to travel for hours, um, that means that less of the time is actually spent on um, education and therefore you often get people getting trapped into kind of low pay professions or perhaps subsistence farming um, and this is often again uh, normally done by women or young children and so it disproportionately affects those groups more than anyone else. Also we have issues with treatment. Here's a picture of a man who is washing himself um, in the river Ganges and because there is often in uh, developing countries, MICs and LICs, a lack of funds to treat all the water, you often get things like the Ganges or other river sources, so rivers and wells that remain untreated and therefore people can catch diseases from them. Uh, the Ganges is particularly bad because they put a lot of domestic and industrial waste into it, which causes a lot of people for people consuming it. Lastly, we have issues with the delivery um, of the water. You can see a young man here is pouring water um, into a bucket. And often these containers can be, you know, used, uh, that are used or dirty. And therefore the water, you know, if it's left in a bucket like that, it's very vulnerable to uh, pollution of some sort, whether it's dirt, um, from the actual container, dirt from outside it, or even just insects growing 
in it and breeding in it. And therefore, that can again lead to more diseases and the quality of the water is very poor for human consumption. The issues that you find in uh, developed countries like the UK are often slightly different. Um, the, the main issue is that um, the cost of building the pipe networks and the reservoirs that store all the water is very, 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 very expensive. Um, but it's not only that, once you've got them built, it's actually maintaining them. And um, once these complex networks are maintained, they're hard to, to stop from leaking water. And actually, of all the water that's supplied in the UK, 25% um, is actually lost in leaks. So again, different problems in maintaining that clean water supply.